Hello, I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to show how I make these really neat cabinet handles. I had this super warped leftover chunk of cherry, and rather than throwing it in the bin, I thought I would make some handles for the desk that I built. Let's start this one off with a pro tip. When ripping a piece of wood that is not flat, use a bandsaw or jigsaw. Trying this on a table saw carries too much risk of kickback. After roughing parts to size of the bandsaw, I head to the joiner to flatten a face and square one edge. When flattening a piece that rocks back and forth, I try to find the middle point and take a pass. It's totally fine to rock it to one side or the other, but more wood will need to be removed to get that first flat face. With one flat face and one square edge, I head to the planer to make the second face flat and parallel to the first one. Finally, it's back to the bandsaw to rip the parts down to size. Here's the end result. I have a bunch of pieces that are a little under a half inch square. Using the mighty table saw sled, I cut the middle portion of the handles to length. Okay, here we go. Cobra Kai's down by two. Farrington from Three Point Land at the buzzer. It's gone! The YouTube viewers go crazy! Okay, back to work. Next up, I mark for the joinery. This is rough. I know I need to cut just a little deeper than this mark. Meanwhile, over at the bandsaw, I have set up a depth stop. I've also set the fence to proper width. I like the bandsaw for this type of operation because it's fast to move from cut to cut. This could easily be done at the table saw, but it would be a little slower and certainly more stressful. And you can see I've cut just a little deeper than the marked line. One of the downsides of having a huge workshop is the long walks between tools. After making the cheek cuts on the tenons at the bandsaw, I mosey over to the table saw, or as I like to call it, the mesa saw. I cut the tenon shoulders at the table saw. The table saw will leave these more crisp than the bandsaw would. Please note that I'm making these cuts so the little offcut piece isn't trapped between the blade and the flip stop. If one of these squares gets loose and goes diagonal between the blade and flip stop, it could cause the blade to deflect and mess up the cut. This is known as a bridle joint, and with the tenons all done, the next step is to cut the mortises. I've left the depth stop in place and I made a fence adjustment. I make two cuts to define the cheeks of the mortise, then hog out the waist in between. I do this to both ends of several pieces, which will make sense as the video unfurls gloriously before you. It's much easier to cut the mortises at the bandsaw on the ends of long pieces. So I cut mortises on both ends, then chop off the needed length at the table saw, which is, by the way, an inch and three sixteenths. 
Here's a look at my growing pile of parts. At each step, I cut some extras because that just seems like the right thing to do. I'd like to take a minute to share a few thoughts on design. With this current desk project, I had two elements, gray painted cabinets and a cherry countertop, and I didn't want to bring in a third element such as brush nickel for the handles. So I thought making cherry handles to match the countertop would really tie things together, and this is a look at my first attempt. I liked the contrast between the end and face grain, but things felt too bulky. Attempt two was better, less bulk, but not too dainty. I also realized I would need two different lengths, one for the doors and one for the drawers. So I ended up making several lengths so I could play around and see what looked best to my eye. For the doors, I was torn between a four inch and a three inch version. I think both would have worked okay, but in the end I went with the three inch. For the drawers, it was either 5 inch or 6 inch. I ended up going with the 5 inch because it seemed more proportional when on the smaller drawer face. This video is brought to you by the Double Taper Sanding Disc. When installed in your table saw, it will sand the edge of a workpiece to a perfect 90 degrees. It will sand MDF, plywood, or solid wood equally well. If you'd like one for your shop, check the links below. Now it's time for some surface prep before glue up. I'm only doing the inside surfaces. The rest will be cleaned up using a different technique after the glue is dried. All right, who could name the movie my shirt is based on? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the better movies of 1994. Onward to the glue up, I sized the mortise and tenons so they wouldn't need a clamp. That does however mean a little pounding is in order. I used an extra piece with a mortise on the end to tap the joints closed. Once the glue is dry, I knock down the hangover joinery with a hand plane. After the hangover joinery has been cured, I sand all surfaces with 180, then 220 grit sandpaper. I like to use my workbench as a giant sanding block. This works great with adhesive back sandpaper. These handles are going to be installed using screws, so I mark for center. With my aging eyes, I find it easier to set my square slightly more than half the thickness. Then mark all four sides. The spot with no pencil is the exact center. I use a brad point bit to drill the pilot holes, and I find it very easy to line up the point of the bit to the center mark, or non-mark as it were. Moving right along, it's now time for some finish. For smaller projects, there's nothing quicker and easier than rattle can lacquer. Quick story, when I first started my woodworking business, I didn't have enough money for a spray system and I had just gotten a commission for Big China Hutch, maybe six feet wide, seven feet tall. I finished the entire project with like 40 rattle cans of lacquer and you know what, it looked great when it was done. Now it's time to install these puppies. I think there are two choices. Line up the top screw hole with the center of the top rail or with the lower edge of the top rail, right where the panel starts. I like the second option. To make sure I'm consistent and accurate, I use this cool jig. It's not inexpensive, but it will pay for itself pretty quickly. Repainting a door that's been drilled wrong is a costly mistake. I bought this one like a million years ago when the company was called Precision Casework. Since then they changed their name to True Position Tools. Same jig with a different name. I think these are called round washer head screws. At any rate, these will be used to hold the handles in place. 
The pilot hole that I used left a little play, so I double checked that the handles are parallel with the edge of the door. I use the same jig to drill for the drawer poles. I mark for center and of course, I check from both sides because I am a belt and suspenders kind of gal. After I installed the handles, I reinstalled the doors and drawers into the desk. Oh, and if you like the look of this desk, I'll be releasing a full build video as well. I think overall the handles turned out pretty cool. Whether you like them or not, I can say without a doubt that they help with opening the doors and drawers. So yeah, that's a win in my book.